So um, Andy's really teed up, um, really teed decision making up quite nicely. Um, and I guess I'm only going to work off one slide. So I definitely don't have the resources that the, the amazing resources Andy had to his disposal there. But I guess what I really want this to, to become is something that's really practically meaningful um, for you as coaches or for the academics in the room as something to go and perhaps provoke some curiosity or to go and perhaps look at something in a different way, which is really all I'm aiming for um, in the research that I conduct. And I just want to start on Andy's Descartes quote, I think, therefore I am. As um, I think what this is really getting to the root cause of is this idea of rational thought, um, that as humans we are, we are graced and we are blessed with the fact that we have rational thought. And I think that is something that I'm really going to try and touch upon as I progress throughout the next 15 minutes and the fact that that might be a root mechanism in understanding how athletes, how participants or players in a multitude of sports make decisions, which as we know is an extremely complex uh, subject area. So before, before I really wanna get into this, I, I wanna start with where, where my journey began in trying to explore player decision-making, especially within rugby union. And it actually started uh, with a very depressed Mike Ashford back in 2015 after England were knocked out of the uh, the Rugby World Cup by Australia, after also being beaten by Wales. But what eventually coincided with that tournament is the fact that all of the Southern Hemisphere teams made the semi-final. And there was a great Telegraph article that was titled Southern Hemisphere Brains Thoroughly Eclipse Northern Hemisphere Brawn. And uh, that really intrigued me. I read the article thinking, oh, they're going to tell me why. What What is it about brains versus brawn that really segments and differentiates uh, though, those these two hemispheres of rugby and I, I couldn't find anything in there that told me about one what decision making was uh, or two how it can be best to be best be developed and so therefore that really provoked my curiosity um, and luckily Andy had posted um, a PhD around the role and development of decision making how can we understand it in order to to better support the development of players and that really sent me into uh, this PhD, which stupidly, as Sergio said, was titled Defining the Role uh, and Development of Tactics and Decision-Making in Rugby Union, which I can guarantee you I haven't defined. Uh, but I think that's the beauty of this subject area. And I just want to start on two quotes. So the way we see the world depends on the lens we look through. And in a subject area like decision-making, I think that it can be no more prevalent, that quote. And as we progress throughout the, the subject uh, areas of what I'm going to discuss, if we put on different lenses, we see the world differently. And what I mean by that is that this, the literature around decision making has been separated and segmented into three perspectives. Uh, the traditional view or the original view is suggested to be this information processing idea. Information processing would suggest that, as Andy put so eloquently earlier, we, we perceive information, we then relate that information to our memory, and within that memory is a mental representation. And I will define a mental representation as an internal depiction of an external reality, and then use that mental representation to make a decision that then leads to a consequence. So very similar in the mechanisms that Andy discussed earlier from a coaching point of view. So that's one perspective, information processing. The more contemporary perspective, as Carl Woods has recently uh, titled it, is ecological psychology or from a decision-making point of view, ecological dynamics. Um, and this theory is relatively, relatively dominant in the area of decision-making at the moment. And it would suggest that perception an action can't be separated from the demands of the environment. So if we think of a sport as a task uh, with an environment and with an organism or an individual, it suggests that the, the information that is being derived from that environment and from that task cannot be separated from the action and that decisions then become emergent, absent of mental representations. So that internal store that's included in memory isn't there and instead it's a lot more of an embodied process in the fact that our action capabilities so what we can do technically and physically 
directly allow us to see and perceive what is going on in the environment. So you might hear this statement thrown around quite often, uh, perceive to move and move to perceive in a reciprocal fashion. And then finally, perhaps a, a mediating variable a, that is underpinned by the information process and perspective is this idea of naturalistic decision making, which uh, is very much embodied in what Andy discussed earlier from Daniel Kahneman's work. In the fact that people make decisions and players or participants make decisions based on an assessment and a recognition of the information that is being presented to them. And this, is all, this all hinges on the idea of typicality. So how typical is that information to me as a decision maker? So if it is extremely typical, then we tend to rely on what Andy called intuition. We tend to provide a simple match between the information and what my action capabilities allow. But then if that information becomes atypical, it starts to become more, more foreign or things change or our expectations change, then we are likely to have to diagnose the information that's available in front of us in order to come to, to an action. So in other words, we might have to go to our internal memory, access mental representation and come to an action. And then finally, level three, so level one, two, and now three, information may be typical, but we, it may have a huge consequence that's aligned to it. So in other words, we might have to evaluate and mentally rehearse the possible actions that we might take in order to come to a decision. So recognition prime decision-making, which is the naturalistic point of view, would suggest that there are three levels, which is simple match, diagnosis and evaluation that are dependent on the typicality of the information available. So realistically, what I'm gonna talk about now is that there are well over 60 terminologies that have been used to describe decision-making in team sports alone. And um, I found this extremely complex, extremely convoluted. And alongside this, the implications that have been offered to coaches are, are quite contradictory and quite confusing. And that, um, referring back to the, the article that Sergio mentioned at the start, that was really the purpose behind the communal language paper. So what I'm going to do now is, with those three perspectives, is I'm going to offer the perspective I've created throughout my PhD, along with Andy and Jamie Poulton, and really offer some insight on how we can perhaps better understand our players or our athletes or our participants' decision-making in order to better support the way we, de we, we develop their decision-making. So first things first is information can only be born from the game or the task itself. And what I really want to touch upon here is the idea of the, is the uniqueness of game forms if we're looking at participants below the age of 13 or in particular sports if we're looking at the participants above 13. So the reason why I've used those age categories is in accordance with Cote's uh, developmental model of sport participation is that it would suggest that around 13, 14, we begin to specialise and then invest in particular sports. And before that, we might consider game forms, so invasion, net wall, as, as more prevalent. In, in, considering the, in considering the information that's being presented to a player or an athlete. And the reason why I really wanna focus on the game as a start point is every game has a set of rules and a pre goal. So that pre goal might be to score more points than your opponent, to take 20 wickets, um, to execute a routine in its perfect form without losing too many difficulty points, so on and so forth. So uh, that in its entirety, demands what information is then produced to a player. And we can't, we can't ignore that. And I think under 13, we should, we should begin to experiment with those laws because all invasion sports, for example, have the same preliminary goal, which is to outscore your opponent. So we might make it multi-directional. We might not have our sidelines, but we're still keeping the game in its truest form to that game form of invasion games, which then transcend more into rigid rules and unique games. And that's where the player then comes in. So we've been presented this game that has a preliminary goal and a set of constitutive rules. That then creates a legal suite of actions or decisions that can never be done at any one time. And that's really important because decision-making therefore is defined 
by the rules and by the, the goal of the game, as I find it very unlikely, unless they're doing something completely illegal, that anyone would try and make a decision to move away from the pre illusory goal. So I also want to touch upon the context of which you're working in. So just to refer on and Dave Collins' work around the three worlds continuum, it's, it's really important to consider what context the individual athlete is considering. So are they there? Are they participating for their personal well-being? Are they there for personal reference excellence? Or if they're in a talent identification and development environment, are they there for elite reference excellence? Because again, that might, that might segment the way you perceive game forms to a particular unique sport. Now, alongside this, as the rules and the pre-illusory goal interact, they create information and relevant information for players, for uh, athletes to identify and perceive. So therefore, decision-making for me in its simplest form is simply an interacting between the perception of information and possessing and acting upon the individual or, or and the collective capability to act on that information in the first place. And you might have heard earlier what Andy was discussing, the idea of mechanisms. And this is extremely important, as, as we said before, uh, with the three perspectives, they differ all, all the differences hinge upon this idea of mental representation. Again, an internal image of an external reality. And that the presence or absence depends, depends on those theoretical beliefs or the lens we look through. And I would segment these into actions for, knowledge of, and knowledge in the game or the sport. Actions for refers to the technical and physical capabilities one possesses in order to act on information. So from an ecological perspective, the higher and more competent your technical and physical capabilities are, the more you'd see and the more you'd be able to act on those invitations for action. But then from an information processing perspective, we have this idea of declarative knowledge and knowledge of the game or knowledge of the sport, where a deep and embedded understanding of why an action is most appropriate allows experts to become excellent decision makers. So these two contrasting beliefs, realistically, I think should be embedded and connected together, where athletes' physical and technical requirements are continuously being developed alongside a declarative piece and an understanding of why those actions are most prevalent given the game information that is being derived by the environment. But then we cannot always plan for what information is going to come. We can't always intend to behave in a particular way. And as we know, sports and a multitude of sports throw up environments where we are required to do something different than, than what we expected. So from a recognition prime decision-making point of view, we are required to diagnose or evaluate if that situation offers us the time to do so. And I think this is really important as what, what you need, then need to consider is how do we allow for those moments with our athletes in order to have a real rigid declarative understanding of why actions are most important, but then also be able to diagnose and strategize when things don't necessarily go their way. So all those mechanisms that are derived from the three perspectives, I think are constantly ebbing and flowing between depending on the situation of the sport. And that's really what I want to finish on is if we as coaches can truly understand the moments that that our athletes are going to face, then we can best start to consider what actions for the game are most appropriate, what suite of actions are required, so passing, movement, fundamental movement skills, sport-specific skills, functional movement skills, depending on the age and stage of the participant, or more strategic skills. So if you think in rugby union, like a line-out, how, how are we going to educate them on the throw? Then at the same time, we might have to support the development of knowledge of and declarative knowledge whilst also considering the game moments that are going to throw incidents that we don't expect. So supporting them to have the knowledge in the game to diagnose and evaluate to come to an to a appropriate decision. And what we found through our research is that it, this seems dependent on the situation that the game itself offers. 
So a, a game such as Rugby Union that was the vehicle we used for our PhD is such a phase-like game where the rules demand completely different solutions at any given time. If you think a kickoff, a scrum, a line out, open phase play and attack and defense, which create different amounts of complexity, different amounts of time, and different amount of options for decision makers. So if time is minimal, then they might rely on their actions for the game in an implicit perception action process. Whereas time increases, we might rely more on deliberative, evaluative processes to come to decisions. And we might then resemble our coaching based on those mechanisms. So if time is available, options are available and complexity is high, then we might offer solutions to players through intentional strategies. Whereas if time is minimal and complexity is low, then we might consider using more incidental strategies like more game-based practice and more emergent discovery-based practices.